good afternoon. Thank you for coming out on this uh, rainy day. And for those who've been in the building all morning and day, it is raining outside, cats and dogs. Um, I'm not originally from around here, which becomes pretty obvious the moment I open my mouth. I came to Canada 11 years ago from the UK, and I'm told that after the age of 40, no, you don't lose your accent if you uh, change uh, continents. So what are we going to be talking about today? What am I going to talk about? Uh, the development and delivery of pharmaceutical products with a big emphasis on the drug formulation and drug delivery side. I'm not going to be really talking about the clinical aspects or the toxicology, although we will touch on that because they're intimately linked. But really, the main thrust is to explain to people who are perhaps starting companies that if you don't understand this area, you've got to get some insight because it can come back to bite you if you haven't considered this during your strategic planning. Little, uh, here are the topics that we're going to address. Uh, you can see introduction. I'll, I'll introduce myself, but I'm going to summarize that because John's stolen all of my thunder. Oh, this is just so good. If you'd only sent me your talk, I could have taken it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about the drug development process and then how the formulation piece fits within that. We'll talk about something I call druggability, which is something that's often forgotten by companies that are starting up that are trying to develop their own medicines. They think about the things they understand, but druggability is a screen, if you will, that uh, really needs to be thought through. Oral absorption um, and how that can impact the drug development process. Something called the Biopharmaceutics Classification System, the BCS, which is actually key in developing strategies for taking one's molecule forward. And then we're going to talk about sterile products. We've talked about oral absorption and sterols, and there's a whole spectrum in between. There's uh, mucosal delivery, there's transdermals, but you can't cover everything unless you'd like me to lock the door and give you the 12 hours of lectures that I am able to give. No volunteers, okay. We won't cut it, we won't do everything. So a little bit about me. I'm a UK trained pharmacist, as it says there. Um, almost. 30 years in the industry. I'm still going to stick to that almost. I used to say 20, but my wife rem reminded me I had to increment that every year. Um, tried to avoid that. I was in Patheon where, as uh, John was saying, I did run their um, development services practice for North America for the last uh, 11 years. And my main, uh, I was with a startup. Was, I always called it an emerging farmer that unfortunately failed to emerge. Uh, it failed, if you will, during the uh, dot-com boom where you couldn't, get, you couldn't raise funds for a, a startup farmer at that time. Most of my training has been within Eli Lilly and I was in Squibb before the Bristol Myers uh, merger. I have been associated with 13 product uh, launches um, through the development, through de from development through to commercial. Um, so a lot of experience there. I can't say I was hands on with each of these. Uh, there were some where I was on at a distance and some where I was very close but it's actually quite a thrill to, become, to be part of that because most people can go through their pharma career without being part of any launch because of the great attrition that there is within the, uh, industry, uh, within the uh, drug development process. I'm uh, the chair of this meeting, as uh, John attested to, and I've recently joined the US Pharmacopeia, the, uh, what's called the Committee of Experts, where they have panels that help revise the Pharmacopeia uh, month on month, year on year. Oops. So we'll talk about the drug development process first. I'm very happy to encourage questions during the uh, talk. Uh, we ha do have time at the end, half an hour at the end for questions, but if you'd like to stop me, uh, we, can talk so we can answer some questions. If time is banging on, then uh, we'll have to curtail that and we'll take that to the end. So let's just talk about the drug development process. And we have here a continuum. The squiggly line on the right-hand side is discovery research. And it's deliberately squiggly because research does not go in straight lines, as many of you will not understand. Then I've got this fake straight line. It's fake in that development isn't quite straight, but I'm going to continue it as a, consider it as a linear continuum for the purposes of this discussion. And you can see it, it starts when discovery research ends, and it really finishes around that submission time when you actually submit some pa a package to the regulatory authorities. Then you launch and then you go into the commercial phase. That's the high level. If we now go to the next level and start to cut up the, the development phase, we've got distinct areas or distinct phases of study. Where it's written toxicology, some people call that preclinical. It's the preclinical effort that enables you to go into a human being with your new drug. Then we have phase one, 
six, 10, 12 subjects, not usually patients. These are people who aren't normally, don't normally have the uh, condition that's being tested. This is more a safety study. Then you get into phase two and the money starts escalating. Quarter of a million dollars to a million dollars maybe, a couple of million dollars for a phase one. You get into a phase two, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars and most startups will perhaps end their um, business plan, if you will, for this project at that point, they will be looking to license out. You're talking perhaps a couple of hundred patients. You're starting to get into patients now because you're looking for an indication as to whether or not the drug is likely to be successful in treating this condition. That's your phase two, and you look at that's called proof of principle. And there's more than one study in, these, in, each, of these, uh, in each of these phases. Then you get into your phase threes, which can be thousands of patients Mass, uh, multiple geographies and you can get into the tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars to manage these studies. So very complicated, uh, incredible management logistical issues but each of these needs to be supplied and supported all the way through. Then you're going to get into a registration uh, phase where you're writing all your documentation ready to submit to the various regulatory authorities around the globe and should you be lucky you get approval and if you're even more lucky, the drug's going to make money. Because many drugs are making it to the market today. It's a billion dollars to develop a drug that gets it to the market. And that's not counting all the ones that fail in the process. The attrition rate is incredibly high here. So what you actually want to do is reduce your spend in the early phases until you've proved enough to start to want to spend later. And that's a really important thinking process for anybody developing a drug. How can I do this as cheaply and as quickly as possible in the early days in the, wor in the words of the Lilly company, how can I kill it quick? It has an 80% chance of not getting past phase one. So how can I do the minimum necessary to prove that it is or is not going to get through? So then the question is, what's going to happen to support it? There's the clinical studies. I've alluded to these. On the left-hand side, safety. Phase one is a safety study. It's purely safety. You're not looking for, tr for treating the disease. Is my compound safe to put into human beings? And prior to that, you've got to have the toxicology phase. Is it safe to go into the first human being? Then the bigger study, proof of efficacy, and then you get into large safety and efficacy. And then after you've launched, there is a regulatory commitment to do post-marketing, post-launch studies to continue to check that the drug is safe. Plus, you'll be looking at line extension, so you'll be looking at different ways of delivering the drug, improvements, if you will, and they all need clinical study. Talk to me. So how is that supported? Now we start, we've got to get the molecule through to the patient. Well, first of all, there's the organic chemistry. In the early days, it's called medicinal chemistry. They're, these are very brilliant chemists who are trying to find molecules that fit receptors, or biologists who are looking at different proteins to try and get them uh, uh, active in the right site. But I'm now going to talk solely about small molecules, but the, the analogy will hold true for proteins as well. You need to identify the route of generation of these small molecules. What is the chemical process? What, do you, what, what two things do you mix A and B to create C? C is mixed with D to create E, and E is transformed somehow to create F, and F is the drug. You've got to come up with a process that becomes standardized, because every time you do a chemical reaction, you have side products. Those side products may or may not be toxic and they have to be studied during the clinical studies. More importantly, they've got to be studied during the toxicology phases to prove that they can go into a human being as something that you don't want there but you can't eliminate. You can't change the chemistry midway through a massive uh, uh, clinical program because that can have disastrous effects. You will come up with new impurities and those impurities may or may not be dangerous you have to prove it along the way. So you'll identify the route. You'll then scale it up. And guess what? When you scale up chemistry, things happen, new chemical processes. So again, you've got to be in control. Everything I'm going to talk about is control. The regulatory authorities want you to prove you are in control of the process and you're not going to do anything weird and wonderful that's going to put anybody, any patient or subject at risk. Then you can... Please. Um, I've, I've heard in the past that uh, there are certain uh, 
sizes of scale up that are more predictable and less risky than others. I've often heard the 10 times rule is okay to go from a one liter to a 10 liter uh, format is okay. To, to jump from one liters to 100 liters, you're asking for trouble. Anything more than that, it's huge risk. C comments, are you gonna deal with that later maybe? I, I wasn't going to, but I can address it in this. Everything associated with drug development is, is, is about mitigating risk. Everything is about mitigating risk. The more you do up front, the more risk you mitigated later on. So, yes, you would tend to do that. Uh, on the pharmaceutical development side, on the formulation side, yes, you would tend to do only a 10 times increment unless you are desperate. And you might jump the 100 times, but then you are taking a risk. Because at the end of the day, you've still got to prove that what you did at the one unit scale, which went into rats, is the same as what you're doing at the 100 unit scale, which is just about to go into human beings, and that's not necessarily going to go back into an animal model. So everything is associated with risk mitigation. So yes, you would tend to do incremental scale up in both process chemistry, this is called process chemistry, medicinal chemistry up front, and then process chemistry is optimizing what you've discovered. Same is true in formulation. You'll tend to do 10 times increments to mitigate the risk. You can make the jump, but you're gonna need 100 times more drug, and drug in the early days is very expensive. Um, you've only ever made a kilo of this and it's cost you five million dollars. So is that five million dollars a kilo? And that's how people treat it. And I wanted, ooh, a gram before, and I want a hundred grams at five million dollars a kilo. People do this math on that, especially the CFOs. And they go, hold on, let's do it 10 times, not a hundred. That's part of the logic, cheaply to fail fast. Then we have what's called dose form development. I'm gonna concentrate on that. So in the early days, you have pre-formulation and early formulation. Then later on, you'll have what's called market image formulation. You really don't want marketing influencing development in the early days. 80% is gonna fail. If they want a green polka dot tablet, fine. But developing a green polka dot tablet from day one is an expensive prospect. More so because it costs more time to develop than does, say, a simple solution. I'll come on to that. So why are you gonna waste money and effort doing the green polka dot thing that marketing wants because that's how we're gonna sell it to the public when in the early days, perhaps we're talking more about, let's just get it into the human being to find out if it has any chance of getting through the process. Let's now cut to the next level of detail on formulation. So for the toxicology phase, you might have a simple solution. You're going to take a solution of that drug into two animal models which are prescribed by the authorities as to what you can and can't do because you're going to use these animal models to determine whether or not it's safe to go for the first time ever into a human being. And you will be dosing the animals at 10 or 100 times the potential intended dose on a milligrams per kilogram basis than you would in a human being because you want a degree of safety margin because animal species are not equivalent to them, between them or between them and a human being. So you want as much safety margin as you can. And there's a problem when the drug isn't soluble. We'll come to that in a bit. Then for the phase one, maybe you'll put together a simple capsule. Maybe you'll use the same solution just to go into human beings. There's some issues with that. If it smells bad, humans don't want to take it. And they have to consent to take this. That's part of the issue historically. They would do drugs trials with uh, inmates in prisons who don't have any uh, ability to say no. You have to have consent today. Absolutely right. So you've got to think about the patient. We'll talk about the patient later. So a simple capsule solution suspension. You're trying to fail fast and do this cheaply. Then in phase two, you'll probably need a tablet. A question, please. Um, in phase one, when you're dealing with simple capsules and you're dealing with dose ranging, how do you deal, or what is your preferred way for dealing with increasing dose, which may escalate to be very, very large, um, and the number of capsules that have to be taken? So the question come, uh, talks to the fact that in early development, you might assume you'll be going, heading for a five milligram dose based on animal information, but by the time you get into a human being, you might find, oh, hold on, we're going to need a 100 milligram dose. And the first safety study has to address 0.1 milligram up to 500 milligrams in one study where you don't quite know where you're going to stop. 
So you could come up with 500 different strengths of capsule, that's too expensive. You actually, come, you actually work with clinical pharmacology to look at the dose ranges they might be interested in to try and figure out the optimal and minimal number of capsule strengths that you can use to cover that range. So you might do a, a 1, a 5, a 25, and if you think about that, a 1, a 5 and a 25, without putting a knife and fork in front of the subjects and saying take 50 capsules, you can probably get quite a wide range of variation of doses just with those three. You might also put 100 in there to cover that all the way up. But I was involved in a clinical study where they, they, the first, they were going to go from 1 to 10 milligram and, and then from 10 to 50 or whatever. And at 10 milligram, all the volunteers started throwing up, which was a an interesting end point to the study. You weren't going to take it any further. It wasn't unsafe. They did know that this drug could be an emetic and it was a central nervous system effect. It wasn't an effect on the stomach. So humans were more sensitive than the animals. So we stopped the study. We actually did that study in a solution. And because we did that, we could just tell the clinic, take the solution, dilute it one in 10, and we could actually go down in scale. So solutions are more flexible but there's a downside which I'll come to later with the solutions. So how do you do it? You've got to understand what the clinical pharmacology team wants. Did that address the question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then you start to get into tablet for your phase twos because it's got to be handled more uh, carefully or, or, or more complex ca capsules. Then uh, you start to get into the market image tablet later on because when you get into phase threes, you want to change the formulation as little as possible because what you're starting to do is provide the data package for the regulatory authorities that enable them to approve your drug. And all changes create uncertainty, and if it's something regulators don't like, it's uncertainty, because you have to prove that you are certain this is safe. Then you get to the registration, you put your package together, a data package, and you're going to be debating and arguing and trying to persuade the regulatory authorities that you know what you're doing because you will always get questions in all aspects of the drug um, package. And if you're lucky, you'll get approval and then uh, you can go on a launch. So drug ability. Most people who are discovering drugs know all about the potency of the drug at the receptor, the selectivity of the drug at the receptor, and that it switches this thing off and by switching this thing off it's going to be it's going to solve ingrained toenail and that's a billion dollar market and I want a piece of it so that's great because at the receptor you know what it's going to do drug ability and formulation design is all about getting the drug there and if you can't get the drug there forget the potency forget the selectivity it's not going to do a thing so drug ability is not a formal term, but those of us in the formulation community apply a set of <coughs> rules, criteria, against which we, should, we need to test any drug to say whether or not it's going to be a challenge. So let's talk about that. What do we do in drug product development? This is a very important statement. Too many words, no commas, and all that other good stuff. But this is a really important thing to think about is in, in drug development. Product drug development is a facilitation Nobody in drug development can force somebody to take a medicine. It, we facilitate it. Hands up anybody here who's got young children or has had young children. Okay. Anybody have, has had to dose that young child with something when they were sick? Anybody who couldn't get the second dose down the kid because they didn't like the first one? <laughs> if you can't get it past that, you've failed. So if, you haven't, if it's not right for the patient, it's not going to work. So it's the facilitation. It's then up to the carer to get in. If you've made it strawberry and they only like banana, you're out of luck. That's not a small matter when it comes to pediatrics, especially in life-threatening conditions. Facilitation of the repeated safe delivery. Repeated. Every single dose has to have the right amount. You've got to be able to repeat it. So we've just said, we just failed. We got the first dose into the child, didn't want the second dose, so it's not repeatable. Safe. Safe by virtue of the fact that this tablet is delivering what the last tablet did and we proved in the clinic that that was a safe thing to do. Of the correct quantity, goes without saying. Let's just talk about the contraceptive pill which has micrograms of drug in it. You, know, and you may not understand how difficult it is to have in a batch of 600 kilos where every tablet is 100 milligram, you've got to have the right number of micrograms of drug in there. 
If you have too little, you get a lot of pregnancies. If you have too much, it upsets the, the, the woman's cycle. So you've got to be very careful with this. And every single tablet's got to have the right amount of drug, every single time. It's got to be the active substance. Drugs, chemicals are reactive, they can go off. That's a bad thing. So we've got to have the right amount of the active substance getting into the body at the correct rate. We'll talk about rates of absorption later. If it gets in too quick, you could get toxicity that you didn't expect. If it gets in too slow, if it gets into the body too slowly, it might not even have a therapeutic effect. And it's got to get to the desired body compartment. Once the formulation has delivered its drug into the body, it's up to the drug to get where it needs to go. And that's really mainly, except in very specialist cases, beyond what a formulator can help with. And here's the kicker. It has to be guaranteed until the expiry date. If you look in your cupboard, all of your medicines have an expiry date. And that is the date up to which the manufacturer guarantees that all the rest of that is true. After that date, the guarantee falls down. Not to say that you might, it might still not do it, but you can't guarantee that. And that's what the regulators have accepted, that that date is justified by the science provided, data package provided to them. So how do we go about that? So we have Fred. Fred was out on the town last night. He's not feeling too well. Could be a she, can't tell from that skeleton. So Fred has a headache. So Fred's feeling rather queasy. If you give him a tablet that doesn't smell well, smell nice, he's not going to want to take it. That tablet or capsule is going to hit the stomach. Now, those of you who know your anatomy will know that when you absorb drug from the stomach and most of the intestine, the, drug, the, the blood goes straight to the liver. Guess what the liver's intended to do? It's intended to eliminate things that it doesn't think the body should have. So it's a factory to metabolize things and get rid of them. If your drug is susceptible to being affected by the liver, and we'll get on to the next level of this in a couple of slides time, then it's not going to get into the bloodstream to get to the target organ. Then in the case of a headache, any drug for the CNS, for the central nervous system, the CNS has extra protective barriers within the body to stop drugs getting in there. It's got what's called the blood-brain barrier. And it's actually more difficult for drugs to leave the bloodstream to get to the brain than it is for drugs to leave the bloodstream to get to other organs. Now, formulation can't help with crossing the blood-brain barrier because the formulation is designed to get the drug into the body, then the drug's on its own, as I described. But it's another barrier to consider. And if you're doing all your research by injecting things straight into the brain, you're missing the point because you ultimately, except in very rare cases, will not be allowed to inject drugs straight into the brain unless it's for a life-threatening condition that there is no other therapy for. It rather depends on the risk-benefit um, ratios of any, uh, in any, uh, for any therapy. So how do you facilitate? That's in general how one facilitates. We're going to start getting into some sciencey stuff. The intent is not that you absorb all of this information. There can be a test at the end, if you like, but that's not the intent. The intent is to show the level of detail at, down, to which you've got to drill down to make a success of delivering a drug. So in formulation, pre-formulation, we're talking about drug ability. You've got to understand the characteristics of your drug and how those characteristics might affect how it gets into the body. So molecular properties, solubility. My drug is brick dust. It won't dissolve. OK, you're not going to get it in the body because unless, it, you've, you, unless you can apply some very specialist technologies, which will become expensive and time consuming in early development. So solubility, if it's not soluble, it's unlikely you're going to get it into the body. You've just failed. Fred's still got his headache because it's not going to dissolve. The tablet is swallowed. It breaks up. The drug dissolves. The drug is absorbed. But if it's brick dust, not going to happen. What's its pH? There are some drugs that are very, very acidic. You really don't want to be swallowing those down the esophagus and damaging it. So that affects how you're going to handle the drug. We can coat tablets with stuff to protect the body from the properties of the drug. We can also do it the other way around. We can actually protect, we can coat tablets to protect them from the acid of the stomach, especially if they are acid unstable. Chemical stability. Chemicals are reactive. 
if this drug is going to react with other things, we need to protect it and stop it from reacting with other things. A common reaction is hydrolysis. It breaks up in the presence of water. Remember I just said we have to guarantee to the expiry date. So if it's going to break up in the tablet over time, uh, you've just failed. And I'll give you a really good example, aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. Lots, you've, you've all probably taken little tablets of it at some point in your life. You may have even had tablets that are effervescent you put in water that you then swallow within a few minutes because the label says swallow quickly. You've never seen aspirin ready to use liquid. Why not? Because aspirin degrades to acetic acid. So if you take an aspirin tablet, leave it in water for a day, come back later, you smell it, you're going to smell vinegar. It's acid, uh, 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 aspirin is reactive. So you've never seen that because nobody can develop it. So they're the molecular properties, then the particle properties. Uh, what's its melting point? We need to worry about its melting point for processing because we don't want it melting on the machines. Um, what's its solution rate? If it does go into solution but sl dissolves slowly, that affects how quickly it gets into the body. Um, particle shape and size. I'm going to show you some pictures of that and why that's important later. And then the powder properties, odor, color. We've talked about odor, especially for kids. Really, really important. Also important perhaps for other patient populations. We've talked about pediatrics. Let's talk about geriatrics. Patient population is a really important subtopic in drug development. Alzheimer's disease. Uh, example in Alzheimer's disease is some people with Alzheimer's, you know, they, they lose their mental capacity. You can imagine that some of these patients will refuse medicines they don't like or the look of or have the look. So imagine as a caregiver trying to give an Alzheimer's disease uh, to somebody with Alzheimer's disease something they don't like the smell of. It's the same sort of issue, but you've got to think about this. Also in Alzheimer's disease, um, there is a uh, they can develop what's called dysphagia, an inability to swallow or a difficulty in swallowing. So the dose can't be horse pill size. People with arthritis can't pick up tiny tablets. So don't develop a tiny tablet for people with arthritis. So you've got to think about those little aspects as well as how do I get the drug in the body. So Colin, a question. Um, some drugs also have a particularly foul taste. Do you deal with taste masking at this stage, or is that a later stage? No, you, absolutely, really good question. You have, to divert, you have to think about taste masking in the very early stages. So a solution in phase one is actually difficult to get away with. This medicine I said that we did as a solution had a sulfurous smell. So we actually, and we knew that from, from development, because guess what? It's going to humans for the first time. Does it have a taste? Who's going to be the first person to taste it to decide whether it's got a taste? Catch-22 situation. So um, we knew this had a smell, so we put, sent it into the clinic, and the pharmacist was instructed to put one drop of peppermint oil in each dose before it was given to the patient, just to cover up the smell. It was a sulfur-containing sulfur compound. We knew it would smell and taste, but we overwhelmed that with a peppermint. Yes. So yes, in the early days you have to, and later on you've got to be more careful, especially with the different patient populations. Thank you for the question. So this is all associated with drug ability. Is it soluble, etc.? Is it stable? Which of those is going to come back and bite me? Because anything that bites me in drug development costs time, money, and drug. And in early development, companies that have limited funds don't have much time, money, or drug. Now we're going to get on to oral absorption and we're going to get into real sciencey stuff and I'm not asking you to remember this. So let me just go over to, the, to describe this diagram. The only drug that can get to the target organ is the drug that is bioavailable. And that is a formal term within the industry. So this is the intestine, that's the mouth, that's the other end. So the, the foodstuffs, or in this case the drugs, are traveling from the top to the bottom. The drug has to get across the wall of the intestine. There's passive transport. It just gets absorbed because of osmotic pressure, for those that know os about osmotic pressure. It can go through what's called active transport, where proteins in the cells pick it up from one side of the cell and transport it over to the other side. These are called cytochromes. There's all, there are also proteins within cells whose job it is to throw molecules out that they doesn't like the look of. The body is designed to keep stuff out that it doesn't think you should have in there. And these are called P-glycoproteins, so they're efflux. Uh, they create efflux, so the drug gets into the cell, but is kicked out. So the 
These are affected mainly by the, chemist by the uh, molecular structure of the drug and whether or not it interacts with these proteins. You can cheat. You can sometimes dissolve drugs in oils and create nanoparticles of those oils, and the body will pick up the oil and transport it across, not knowing that the drug's inside it. Very complex technology, expensive, takes a lot more time to develop. So if you do have difficult to absorb drugs, there's stuff you can do to get it across, but it's tough and will cost you. So then it goes through into what's called the portal vein. It's the only vein in the body that doesn't go back to the heart because it goes to the liver because it's there to make sure that everything that's absorbed goes to the liver. The liver metabolizes the drug, or it doesn't, it depends on the drug's properties, including what's called first-pass metabolism. So all the drugs going in there, first-pass metabolism is to try and kick it out as quickly as you can. If a drug undergoes first-pass metabolism, to a, you know, 90 percent of the drug is dissolved, is, uh, is destroyed soon after absorption, uh, that's a bit of a problem, because you've only got 10 percent getting through to the body. So. Um, where I'm coming to is you can get past the liver, but you're going to have to do some weird and wonderful things. The colon does not drain to the liver, so you might have to have colonic delivery. Yes, you can create tablets that go all the way through that don't dissolve until it reaches the colon. Other problems with that, but you can do that. And other ways to avoid the colon, skin delivery, uh, to avoid the liver, topical delivery, or vaginal, oral, uh, if you give it within the uh, mouth, it goes straight into the bloodstream and is more bioavailable. And um, those of you who may have or know people that have angina, the angina drug, nitroglycerin, or its derivatives, is destroyed by the liver really quickly, which is why it's put in the mouth for that. And for the other reason is it gets in quickly because if one has the angina attack, you actually want the effect as quickly as possible. So it's a really good way of getting it in. But that drug is destroyed by the liver easily, quickly. So it's only bioavailable if it gets into the systemic blood uh, circulation. A hey, question, please. Yeah. So during preclinical studies, are we testing whether or not these compounds are degraded by the enzymes that are in the liver? Or Absolutely, you should be, or else you're going into a human being not knowing, and so you're exposing people to something that they shouldn't have been exposed to because you should have done those tests before, plus you haven't mitigated your risk. It's much cheaper to do these studies in animals than it is to do these, this in human beings, if you'd be allowed to. So is it, but is it a in vitro test or an in vivo test? I'll be honest with you, I can't answer that. Are there anybody more versed in toxicology and pharmacology than I am? In terms of SIP inactivation or activation? Yeah, in terms of whether or not there's likely to be first path metabolism in a human. You'll do that in that. I mean, at the animal studies will tell you because you'll get exposed. You'll understand exposure to animals, but I don't I know whether that, you've got. I would think that there would be a test that you could use prior to that. Well, there, there's a whole range of tests yeah. done on metabolism and excretion, yeah. and they're done in animals, and then they're they're also done as part of the vape. But there, but there are also there are also others that well, you'll take human uh, enzymes and put them in dishes. I can't. I don't. This is my, outside my field, okay. and you'll and you'll find out whether the drug is destroyed by the human version of the same proteins. Sure there's an enzymatic. I'm, I'm, sure, do, I'm, I'm sure there'll be regulation on the minimum, num minimum testing you have to do be on that side before you can go into a human being. But it also behoves you to do it because you'll mitigate your risk of failure in a human by understanding it better. Human testing is much, much more expensive than animal testing. And there's all sorts of software for ADME these days anyway. Okay, thank you. There's much more, uh, the, the, the response was there's much more software for modeling what's going to happen in uh, this situation as well. So, Colin, another question here. I mean, there's, there's few drugs that are 100% bioavailable and few that are zero uh, bioavailability. Is there a practical limit normally where you say this is just not going to work from an oral route? Well, I've worked down to about 30% bioavailability, but there's two issues. One is the, more, the, the less the bioavailability, the greater is the likely variability in bioavailability. In variability, you've got to eliminate. There's no point in one being 15% bioavailable and the other, next one being 50% because the two levels of exposure of those, that human being is vastly different. So the lower it is, the more likely you have problems. And here's the other kicker. The drug is the, one of the biggest costs of the tablet. If that drug 
has to be put in at 10 times the amount that otherwise it would have been if the bioavailability was better. The cost of goods becomes tremendous. And I have been part of killing compounds where we have not been able to get the bioavailability up to an economically viable level, never mind safety or anything else. Um, and usually when the bioavailability is low, there's something called food effect. And this is a really significant problem with poorly bioavailable drugs. And one of the things I had on the previous slide was that what's called the log P of the drug, whether the drug is water loving or oil loving as a drug. And food effect is a real killer of compounds in the drug development process unless you can get past it. And essentially the bioavailability is vastly different before and after a meal. Yeah, that speaks to the variability yeah. that you're talking about but, in one individual. But that's variability where you, dose, yeah. absolutely. That's variability where you know what it is, but you can still have bio, you can have variability where it's not food effect. Mm -hmm. It's just variable. And that again is a killer. But with food effect, you can fix it. You can say, always have after a meal or before a meal, but it's not an absolute fix. And you will do studies in humans before or after a high fat meal. And it'll be a bacon sort of meal. And that's a way of testing to see whether you fixed the problem. So let's just now get into some graphs. So you, when you deliver a drug to the body, you want to measure the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream. Time, for up to 48 hours, and the serum concentration of the drug. And you've got one in green here, one in orange, and one in blue. And you have these two lines. Something here called the minimum effective concentration. If the concentration of drug does not exceed that, it's not effective. You're not going to cure the problem that's the, 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 the condition. And you've got another line here, the minimum toxic concentration. If the drug concentration in the blood gets above that level, you get into toxic effects. So you can see that the green one, perhaps the low dose, doesn't get to the minimum effective concentration. It's not effective. You can perhaps see that the orange one is, and it's effective for two to five hours, so between hours two and five. And then you've got this one, got absorbed, and uh, oh, it's toxic. Maybe uh, nausea and vomiting, something minor like that, maybe something life-threatening. The ratio between these two levels is called the therapeutic index, and it's rather dependent, uh, and you can get away with narrow therapeutic index indices only when, you, when you're treating something very significant. If this is for a headache, this would better be a very wide window. If this is for cancer uh, and there's nothing else on the market, you can, you're allowed a, a narrow window. So this is, this is something one needs to understand. Now, I've got here that this could be different doses of the same drug. It could be different crystal forms of the same drug. We're going to talk about crystal forms in a moment because it's something that most startups who understand chemistry and biology uh, who understand biology and pharmacology will not understand at all. Or it could be affected by the formulation. It is so easy to make a tablet that won't give up its drug. It's so easy, it's called a bullet. And some of the early pills were actually silver coated because they were collected at the other end, cleaned and passed on from generation to generation. It was just thought the act of putting that pill through you was what cured your disease. I think we've come to understand a little more than that. But what I'm coming to is, the tablet has to give up its drug. And it's possible to create formulations that affect these outcomes, even if the drug wants to get in, it, you can actually use, create a formulation that stops it getting in. And this is called the pharmacokinetics. This is the study of blood levels of a substance over time, after dosing or exposure. I've said a substance, it could be um, herbicides. It's what happens in the body to this thing. We're only interested in drugs for this discussion. But PK, is a very complex field of study. Particle shape, I was talking about drug ability. So here is one drug, it's called carbamazepine. If it's generated in a certain way, you get form three. Never mind what, how, how to do that. Form three are these little cylindrical rock-like uh, particles. If you create it in a different way, you get form four you can see that it fundamentally looks different. Needle shape versus spheres. Formulators hate needle shapes. They don't flow. Imagine a glass of ball bearings. You pour it on the floor, they'll go everywhere. They flow. 
Imagine a glass, same glass full of needles. You pour it on the floor, you get this splash of needles in front of you, but they haven't flowed very far. Remember I said I've got to have the same amount of drug in every tablet? You want good flow, or else these tablets will be high in uh, drugs and those tablets won't be. Not a good place to be. So this one, Form 4, has poor flow and it tablets badly, so we can't easily create tablets out of Form 4. This one has good flow and tablets and properties. Also, one of these might be significantly more or less soluble than the other, affecting the ability to provide for exposure. A question. Development of the crystalline form, does that happen uh, routinely after the production of the API? So yeah. downstream of the production of the active molecule? It is done during, after production of the active mo actual molecule, but you do have to set the crystal form you intend to study early in the process. If it changes, you have to do studies to prove that that change isn't going to cause a problem. There have been examples where throughout all of the development up to the middle of phase three, you've only ever seen crystal form A because sometimes they can come up spontaneously. And by the way, when it happens, you can never go back to the other ones. Like this new thing has appeared in the world and now everything wants to be the same as this. And it's true, they wonder if there are seeds now in the world that always cause form four as opposed to form three because the chemist could never get back to the original form and they don't understand why and that's a sort of bit of voodoo chemistry. They, uh, but they can't get back to the original form. In this case, they can control the form. So you've done all the studies with form A and now you can only ever generate form B and form B has got a different solubility profile. Big problems, but um, they are surmountable, but they're expensive. Do you see di different crystal and forms occurring uh, at different scale-ups? Yes. You can do it, it can come out differently by virtue of uh, being different solvents for crystallization. Duh, you control that. But yes, scale up can cause different crystals or different ratios. You might always have a fixed ratio, 70 to 30. I'm using that hypothetically, it's not the case here. You get one or the other depending on the chemical process, but that ratio suddenly changes on scale up and they trying to figure out why they can't. So you then have to figure out how to live with that. So the biopharmaceutics classification system. This is actually a simple thing, but it really comes back to bite. Two properties of molecules. They are soluble or they're not soluble. That's one property. Or they're permeable or they're not permeable. And the permeable, permeability is that thing where it gets through the gut wall and goes into the bloodstream. So it's easy to classify. If it's highly soluble and highly permeable, Yes, I want to work with that compound and I can show everybody how wonderful I am because it's so easy to get into the body. That's class one. And by the way, this was developed in the 90s and the FDA and most regulatory authorities use this in some form or other. It's part of the regulation today of what you need to do to develop your drug. So let's just talk about this for a little more carefully. Class four, low solubility, low permeability. Brick dust that doesn't want to be absorbed. I'm screwed. However, if it is for a life-threatening disease that really isn't well addressed in the marketplace, you might need to try and work on this one. But you've got big problems. Then you've got high solubility, low permeability. This is the one where form, uh, it's tougher for formulators to help with, because even if you dissolve it, it's still tough to get it through the blood, uh, into the bloodstream, although there are some technologies that you can address, apply. High solubility, high, sorry, low solubility, I've got this wrong. Low solubility, high permeability. I can address it by, make, by, create, by forcing it to be soluble. This is the one where formulators can help a lot. Rats. This is the one where it's tougher for a formulator because the drug already wants to dissolve. It just does not want to get absorbed. And that's where you've got to apply some exotic technologies, some of which can be relatively toxic. So therefore, you've got to think about what you want to do. If you have a class one, you can get waivers from the regulatory authorities as to some of the clinical studies you need to do because they know you dissolve the drug, it gets in there. If you've got a class four, you'll get no waiver for anything. You'll have to do it all. So this helps understand the complexity and, pri and cost of and timing of your drug development. Now here's where it becomes influential. A study was done uh, in 2007 and it was a, a book by a gentleman called House. Um, and he was talking about 
oral lipid-based formulations, and these lipid or, or lipid-based formulations are starting to apply the technologies to make things more bioavailable. Let's just look at this pie chart. BCS class ones, only 5% of new chemical entities in development, because they took a snapshot of everything they could find in development. Only 5% of chemical entities in development were class ones, the slam dunks. I can do this, this is, this is an easy one. 70% were class two. Class two, low solubility, high permeability, the ones we can fix, but are gonna cost more to fix. Class three, 5%, in other words, poor, uh, highly soluble but low permeability. Class four, the real tough is, 20%. Now, they made an assumption, whether or not this can be retained to be assumption, is they took a snapshot of the top 200 drugs marketed in the US at the same time. And they, the assumption was that this essentially translates into that. The problem with that is, that's today, in development, that was historically in development. So the question was, was this true? But let's assume that it was true. So that 5% becomes 30, a third of what's actually on the market. That 70%, at least half of them, and it's not as black and white as this, are gonna die because they don't get through, probably because they can't be delivered. Class three, we seem to get a lot of those coming through. And class four, you're gonna get a massive amount of attrition, probably because we just cannot deliver them. So just because it was effective at the receptor and it was, it was clean, doesn't mean to say you've got a drug. That's why drugability is important and understanding when to kill it is absolutely key. So bioavailability enhancement, there's no one solution. There's no magic wand. Oh, this is molecule, I can model it. Magic wand, I can now get it into the body. It's time consuming. And, it's, and it can be expensive. I'll move on to sterile products now, and I'll probably speed through this a little bit. The intent of this is to again show the complexity of what's involved in making a, pro making a sterile product, and that ultimately you need expertise to help address it. So when a sterile product's required, essentially when you're going to bypass the body's defense systems, your body is designed to keep stuff out that it thinks shouldn't be in there. So the moment you inject something, you're bypassing the skin and your skin is actually your biggest protection uh, organ in the body. It's much of your skin is designed to keep the outside out. So the moment you're gonna bypass the skin, it's got to be sterile. Ophthalmic, well your eyes are wandering around in a non-sterile environment, but really they are relatively susceptible so you don't want to flood them with non-sterile you don't want to flood them with bugs that are going to overwhelm their defense mechanism. So ophthalmic drugs are sterile too. Inhalation, if you're going to use an inhaler, uh, then you're going to be putting a lot of vapor into the lungs. Your lungs are designed to uh, get rid of bugs and other things, but again, you just don't want to overwhelm the uh, defense mechanisms. And in wound applications, so when there is a wound in the body, you've, it's bypassed the defense mechanisms. Okay, a product is either sterile or non-sterile. There's no gray zone. It's like being pregnant. You can't be slightly pregnant. But some people think about sterility as a, a continuum. No, it's a binary uh, system. This sterility test is destructive. You can't say, oh, is that sterile? Oh, yes, it is. Now let's use it. The actual test itself is destructive and time consuming. Sterility tests need to be developed and validated for each formulation because formulations can confound the test itself. And here's some scary math, scary stats. Probability of a, that a package will test positive on sterility testing for aseptic processes, I'll talk about those in a minute, is only one in a thousand. That means that every thousandth injection, somebody's gonna get bugs. That doesn't sound good. When it's heat sterilized, it's one in 10,000. That really, that's, well, that's better, but you know, so for every 10,000 injections, and there's probably 10,000 injections being given today down University Avenue, one person's gonna get a dose of bugs, that's not good either. But you can see, number one, this is 10 times better, and two, the probability of sterility failure is much lower when validated processes are followed. The cost of managing and maintaining sterile facilities and managing these processes is high. So you only go sterile when you need to. The other thing is, 
You've heard of sterility. Hope, I don't know whether you've heard of pyrogens or endotoxins. There are some bugs that when they die, they give up proteins that will enter the solution that if injected can cause problems. Minor moderate fever. These, thing, these things are called pyrogens. Endotoxins are called pyrogens because they've always been, no, injections were known to give fever reactions, but they can enter the uh, life-threatening they can, and essentially death because you get organ failure. So you really want to keep pyrogens out of there. How can you sterilize? You can autoclave in the final container. That's heat sterilization. Sterilizing gases and re ionizing radiation are usually used for devices, uh, implants or wound dressings, etc. Uh, you really want to wouldn't want to apply a sterilizing gas to a pharmaceutical because by definition you're actually causing a chemical reaction and you're probably going to destroy the drug. I have heard of ionizing radiation being used on drugs, but again, you're inducing energy into some system that might not be able to handle it. And aseptic processing, where you essentially filter it to make it sterile, and then make sure that your handling post-filtration doesn't add bugs. So heat sterilization. Regulatory authorities insist you use it if you can, but the thing is you're cooking. You're effectively cooking the formulation, and guess what? Not every chemical likes to be cooked, so you'll destroy it. Um, but they're filtered first to, kill, to, to eliminate the bugs before sterilization because those bugs that die will give up endotoxins. So you've got, to sterilize, you've got to filter it first. Every time you use one of these filters, you've got to test it afterwards to check that it was actually patent. If it failed during its procedure, you've got a problem. Heat sterilization. The actual formulation affects whether the bugs are going to be killed by the heat sterilization process, so you uh, have to validate each one. And here's a, here's a sort of example of what a cycle looks like. 120 degrees Celsius for somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes. Some round numbers there, but that's what heat sterilization looks like. Sterile filtration. I'm not going to read through this slide. I th I'm just like you to just read it and, and understand that it's not an easy process. You actually have to practice a lot to do it. You actually got to validate with uh, what's called a media run that you're doing it right. So you actually have media that bacteria will grow, with, grow in and practice your run with media before you do the real thing. And you have to do media runs every so often to prove to yourself you're still in control of that because there's a, la there's a level of uh, hazard here. And You've got to sterilize and depyrogenate. The, uh, the, the, the containers as well, because there's no post-handling sterilization. With heat sterilization, you're sterilizing the packaging as well. So what sort of sterile products we've got? Um, and these are essentially in an increasing order of complexity. So. We have sterile liquids. The ready-to-use liquid is the one where the doctor holds it up with a very long needle and says, I'm ready, are you? But with this, you can only do it if the drug is water-soluble. Pretty obvious. It's got to be stable in aqueous solution for a commercially viable length of time. You do not want to market a drug without a minimum of 18 months. 24 months, 36 months is an ideal. Because You've got, to keep the, you've got to keep the marketplace supplied with stuff that's going out of date pretty quickly. And the preferred storage temperature, no surprises, is room temperature. Cold chain uh, logistics are really difficult to manage. Uh, insulin is probably the most common one that sort of cold chain manage. It's expensive, and if it reaches your pharmacy and you've lost track of it, you have to throw stuff out. That's expensive. Then if your drug is sufficiently water soluble but isn't sufficiently stable, you have to, you can actually sterilize it and then you won't be able to heat sterilize it, you have to cold sterilize it or sterilize it at room temperature, then you've got to drive the water off. And there's a process called lyophilization which is weird, wonderful and exotic and it will add several dollars, not cents, dollars to the price of every vial. This has gone red on me. Mm. So. And essentially, you can actually force water to sublime, another word for evaporate, from a frozen state um, when you reduce the pressure. 
you'll freeze it, you reduce the pressure, then you, and you'll freeze it to about minus 40 degrees centigrade, decrease the pressure dramatically, then raise the temperature very slowly, and the water will come off as a vapor from the ice. A bit like if you've ever seen uh, the dry ice, you know, the carbon dioxide dry ice. You can actually force water to do the same thing. That's how most biologics are developed. They're because you cannot heat sterilize a protein, you'll denature it. If you cook an egg, it goes solid. You, and so it, it will never create the chick. So this is how most biologics are formulated and developed. It's expensive, as I mentioned. Um, sterile powder fills. You'll actually make the, the drug substance itself sterile while you're doing the final stages of chemical synthesis. And it's used for drugs that otherwise cannot be sterilized. And they also use cephalosporins. Injectable cephalosporins and cytotoxic drugs are used for pretty life-threatening conditions, which is why they're allowed. But you really don't want to go this route because there's no post-handling sterilization. And lastly, and this is the only slide on this, there are dispersed sterile doses forms. You can actually make emulsions of drugs in oils in water. They have to be very stable and the emulsion particle size has to be tiny because if not, you will clog capillaries. You do not want to clog capillaries in the, in the uh, brain, for instance. Uh, but if you, if you clog capillaries in the leg, you'll cause pain and the drug won't get delivered. But you can, you can make um, sterile emulsions and get them in the body. You can solubilize them with surfactants. Surfactants are certain very specialist type of molecules. And I've worked on this. It's great, but you can get some uh, histamine reactions. So again, for life-threatening conditions where it's dosed in the hospital and they have the antidote kit for histamine reaction. The trouble with this one was dogs are much more sensitive to this um, uh, surfactant, to, to tween the surfactant in you. So doing the toxicology studies and animal studies was really tough because we had more dogs having issues with the histamine reaction than we did ultimately humans. So we had to figure out how to get through this process. What I'm trying to show is the more you go down that list of liquids, life, uh, liquids, uh, aseptic, etc., this gets more complicated and time consuming. So hopefully this has opened your eyes to some issues or what's involved in drug development from a product perspective. These are the various topics that uh, I've addressed. Uh, thank you, and if I can have any more questions. Thanks. Great, well we have time for a number of questions. Um, I, I might kick off with one. Um, there have been a number of challenges with formulations that have been um, well addressed by some very clever people over the years. What's the next big challenge that you see in the formulation field which looks like it could have a new solution to it? The big challenge in the formulation field is that more and more compounds are being developed that just don't dissolve. So I've, ad I've addressed the point there. There aren't sufficient uh, fixes for the number of molecules that are coming out. Let me just go back. So this, this, this is one of the scariest graphs that I've seen in the industry from a, if I can find it, yeah, your two pie charts. the two pie charts, yeah. that more and more molecules are coming out, uh, BCS class two, three, and four. Big Pharma is now outsourcing its drug discovery because it's shutting down its discovery units and it's actually relying more on startups, which is great. But to my mind, the biggest issue is that the startups don't understand this issue because, as I mentioned, um, I believe most startups understand the, 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 the pharmacology or the, the biochemistry, perhaps, of their molecule and don't necessarily understand drug abilities. I've described it. So I think there is a trend to, to more tougher and tougher molecules. Now, is that a bad thing? No, if we can come up with solutions to badly, poorly soluble compounds. There are more technologies becoming available. And it's not, you, as I said, you can't look at a molecule and say, oh, this is, this is a technology C. Uh, the next one's a technology A. You've actually got to test them in each of these um, various platforms to decide which one has a chance of solving the problem. So I think further study of how to address poorly soluble compounds is the biggest area where somebody's going to have a breakthrough. Best example is 
biologists will come up to me and say, well, I dissolved it. Yes. In DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, it's a universal solvent. It will dissolve just about anything. Including you. Yes. <laughs> and it has been approved in one or two compounds. Uh, it was uh, the, the topical herpes um, compounds. Yeah, acyclic, things like that. But really, you don't want to use it. It's a rather nasty substance. It's toxic. It, the liver, it does weird and wonderful things to the liver. But biologists will come and say, well, it is soluble. It dissolved in this. We got it into the animals. And now deal with it. So okay, using that as an extreme, between the DMSO and pure brick dust, there's a spectrum. So I think that, to, to answer your question, addressing poorly soluble molecules is the big issue of the moment. Thank you. Could you comment briefly on drug interactions and how that is assessed during uh, the early stages of clinical development? It does not tend to be addressed in the early stages of clinical development. It, I, I believe, now this is not my area of expertise, but I, I will address it to a point that I can. I just wonder if there's anyone else in the audience who might be able to help. The, my, my area of specialty is getting the drug into the body, not worrying about the interaction. However, during some of the pharmacological testing, and some of the testing with um, the, uh, can't think of the right word here, uh, protein, the, the cytochromes. So I can't think of the right word, but bear with me a second. I know that my drug has a high metabolism in the liver. If that is given concurrently with another drug that affects liver enzyme activity, that's a drug interaction because let's just say 50% of my drug is metabolized in the liver first pass. If I give another drug that destroys the ability of the liver to uh, metabolize my drug, the concentration of the drug that my drug in the body is gonna increase. And that, I that is a classic drug interaction. So things that will be tested for, if we know that my drug is affected by this cytochrome and there's various classes of cytochrome Ps, then, um, it needs to be considered that it should be, we should be testing for interactions. We'll never be testing for interactions in humans. It will be done extra externally to humans. But you'll be understanding the mechanisms of interactions that can affect your drug. That's how I believe it's done. Now I just wonder if any, there's some others with experience in the industry, if, you might be, if anyone has any thoughts. Yeah, there's a high attrition rate of drugs that <clears throat> are metabolized by the CYP 450s. And inducing the SIPs is not a good idea either. Um, especially when dealing with cancer drugs. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the cancer drugs are metabolized by the same, um, by a lot of the same mechanisms, the CYP450s, so then when you give a drug that induces it, you're potentially lowering the amount of paclitaxel or whatever in the system. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a, um, not a potential toxicity event, but a potentially lack of efficacy event. Uh, I think, I think if, 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 you, if you had any indication that, as you say, um, your drug was uh, 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 um, affected by the actions of one of the cytochrome um, P450 or something like that, or 330, whatever it is, then you would you would be required to have that in your labeling. I know that's kind yeah. of a lot later on in the drug development phase than we've been talking here, and it would be the, com <coughs> you know, the company or the developer's product uh, problem to prove that their drug didn't interact, yeah. or it, there would be very vigorous restrictions on what patient population you could go to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so because if a patient population is yeah. likely to be on a drug that will be affected, you, you, you might be yeah, told you exactly. can't use it in that population. And during these clinical studies, once you've identified that uh, potential drug interaction X, you will not be allowing people that have been on the other drug into your study because you're trying to study the effect. Um, the, the, you're trying to study whether or not you, you can cure that um, condition. So you might exclude people, but then as, a, as the, I'm sorry, the, your name? Kathy. As Kathy said, you'd have to exclude people taking that drug or warn doctors that they're going to have to do some titration uh, or blood tests, etc. So I'm not sure we've answered you directly. It, it's not done in the early days, 
But I think in the animal testing, you, you look for indications that this could be a problem. If this could be a problem, you'll actually exclude that from the studies because it'll just confound everything uh, dramatically. And then during this process, the toxicological, pharmacological experts will have to come up with uh, ways to address what you're saying. And then unfortunately, idiosyncratic reactions can come out later on. And that's why you have to have continuing studies and vigilance. What did you miss? Oh, 1,000 patients, 2,000, 3,000 patients in a phase three. If you get up to millions of people, there's going to be some idiosyncratic reactions out there that there's no way statistically you'd pick up in a clinical study. David, please. Hi. Do you know if the uh, uh, studies of this P450, for example, inhibition of that cytochrome in, in the animal studies transposes to human experience? Or I don't understand. Do human right. microsomal studies mm -hmm. before you get to animals, often. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh. So you have what, li liver extract, human liver cells, and that you test in the test tube or whatever. Mush. Mush. Ooh. That's why I work in with tablets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you'll say, you might, so you'd actually do it in human, using human cells, or human cell extract. Yes. Even before you go into animals, because animals aren't cheap either, are they? It depends on the person developing, but a lot of pharma will kill their drugs if they have, if they induce or yeah. are metabolized through the sipens. So I had a funny experience with that. We were trying to come up with ways of um, masking taste in early development in those solutions, because we, we had, and you know, we were looking at Coke. Coke's got a pretty strong taste and it masks a lot. So. We would talk to a clinical pharmacology, Coke's great, cranberry juice, great. I say grapefruit juice, and they went, oh, because I didn't know this. Great grapefruit juice induces liver enzymes. And I thought grapefruit juice would be great if I could use it. Okay, so think about that, you know, my naivete. Grapefruit juice, great, because it's pretty strong flavor, acidic flavor, mask anything. And I put that forward and I had the same reaction. You know, what are you doing? I had no idea that grapefruit juice induces liver enzymes. So it's not, so on a joking aside, yeah. it's not just that. If grapefruit juice induces liver enzymes and your drug is if impacted by that, your, you may, your doctor should be advising you that you've got to avoid those. But we have to know that this drug is affected by whichever enzymes are affected by grapefruit juice. Any other questions, please? In which case, thank you. Colin, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.